right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Gretchen Bach. We're at Benton Lane. It's uh, August 19th, 2021. Gretchen, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, the first question to get us rolling is why wine? Why wine? Oh boy, well, I, um, I have a kind of an interesting story. I think it's probably pretty unique for most people in this business. Um, really starting the beginning of my life, just to give you the basics of my how I was raised, my mom's family uh, are hop growers here in the Willamette Valley and have been growing hops for generations. My great-great-grandfather emigrated from Europe and they all got into the hop business. So I wasn't raised on a farm, but my mom was, and so we were very connected to the farm. My dad and mom started a construction company. My dad was a carpenter and eventually started a construction company um, and eventually refined their focus and really became primarily winery builders. They also do anything else, but really have built a lot of the wineries in Yamhill County and Marion County, but really Yamhill County. Um, and so as a kid growing up, I had this influence of farming in my background um, and hard work and all those things and eventually we moved out to 25 acres and so we had a little kind of hobby farm if you will um, but I ended up paying my way through college about my high school years and college years but I literally paid my way through college working in construction for my dad and we built wineries so I was swinging a hammer for years and years and years um, and actually was at Willa Kenzie Winery in Oh boy, I was probably like a freshman or sophomore at Oregon State. And working at Willa Kenzie, Laurent was there at the time, so that might help the timeline to figure out when, when that was. Um, I remember that was like the aha moment for me where I was looking down in the cellar. We were, you know, doing something on the outside of the building. And I remember like looking down, it was, you know, that unique cellar at Willa Kenzie and thinking like, what are they doing down there? Like that looks so cool, you know? And it just kind of like piques an interest for me. And so at that point, I was studying at Oregon State um, ag business in Spanish, or my two degrees, and I thought, wine, it can all come together in wine. Um, and so it was about my junior year of college at Oregon State that I finally went to my parents and said, hey, mom and dad, this construction is really paying my bills. It's great, um, you know, make a nice wage. And I think my parents probably inflated my wage a little bit to help me cover my college bill. Um, but it's not going to lead to me a, a career path for me. And I think I want to work in wine. And they were like, that, that's great, Gretch. You know, go ahead and do it. And I was like, so could I like look for a job at a winery instead of working construction for my last two years of college? And they totally welcomed that. And so I an, ended up writing a letter about myself and mailing it to a certain number of colleges within a reasonable driving distance of OSU. And um, well, I'm at Valley Vineyards. Uh, actually, Joe Dobbs gave me a call in 1999. And literally, Joe, I wrote the letter. I actually worked for Ponzi for like a short minute in their old taste room, the original taste room at the home. Um, realized that taste room wine service wasn't what I was interested in. Um, and, and so I was just there kind of weekends, you know, very odd, like maybe a total of like eight or 10 times that I worked in their tasting room. And then Joe Dobbs gave me a call one day and said, hey, Gretchen, nice to meet you. He was from Malala, I was from Mount Angel. We knew a lot of the same farmers. Um, he could just tell I had that kind of farm kid mentality. He said, do you want to come to work for me tomorrow? And I said, sure, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> so I literally went there the next day. Uh, I spent my first day on the bottling line. They were bottling, um, actually bagging, bag in the box that day. Um, and I sat there and shoved those stupid nipples on those bags all day long. My thumbs were killing me and I just did it all day long. The next day, um, I think I brought in my tool bags because they had some leaking glycol pipes. So I fixed the leak glycol pipes in the cellar. By the end of the week, I had the Spanish speaking crew with me out in the back 40 fixing all the broken pallets and broken pipes and all the things, you know, with my tool belt. And Joe was like, wow, <laughs> this isn't your average college girl, right? Um, and so I quickly, fell in love with wine. Um, it was just this world where I could bring together all of the things that I love, you know, hard work, my construction skills, my Spanish, but more than anything, agriculture, this product that we grow out of the earth that requires, you know, tending to the land and tending to these beautiful vines, the variation that happens every year, all of that really cool stuff. 
you know, it's not like growing broccoli. Like no one's talking about, oh, what vintage of broccoli is this? <laughs> you know, uh, wine is just so nuanced and so amazing that it just had so much more um, interest than any other agricultural product. And ultimately you get to share it at a table with friends and family over great moments and, and sometimes hard moments too. Uh, but just very emotional, beautiful times. Um, and so it just like clicked for me. I was like, this is it. I, I love this industry. Um, so yeah, and I actually skipped across some of my even earlier days and I didn't really know this then, but my mom, so I, I mentioned my great grandfather was an immigrant from Europe. Um, my, my mom had this amazing tradition of keeping us connected to our European roots. And um, to this day, my family are still growing champagne in Reims. And um, even my family in Luxembourg is also, are also growing grapes and lots of agriculture in, in my Luxembourgish family. And when I was an eighth grader, my mom took me back to Europe with my best friend and I for my first trip to visit our family and get to know my family in Europe. And I got to go again in college and in high school. And I've now taken my daughter to go visit that family and see it and keep our connections really tight. But, you know, it's really been in my family's roots for generations, this agriculture as well as wine growing and hop growing and, you know, that world. So it's, it's really, really been a part of my family for a long, long time. Um, so anyway, back to the end game, like, you know, went to work for Joe at Willamette Valley Vineyards. I think within a few weeks it clicked for me that, that I just, I love this. I think I can put a lot of my skills together. So I ended up, um, that was summertime. So I ended up working that summer at Willamette Valley Vineyards and was like, oh, I'm in. Like, I can't miss harvest now because like, this is gonna be the most exciting thing ever. So I ended up getting a hold of my counselors at school and switched my schedule. For the fall term, I pushed back as many credits as I could to the second half of the year, worked the least amount of credits for that fall I actually even got an internship, so I got some credit for the work I did at Willamette um, and dove in and did my first harvest of 1989 um, as a full-on cellar rat. And just, I mean, I just loved it. And I worked with the interns and I helped Joe hire people and get them housing and all the aspects of that. Um, and then I ended up having to work like, you know, crazy credits for the spring, but I stayed on at Willamette all through the school year, which I never expected I would do. Um, but I just was so in love with it that I was like, I'm not going to quit. I just want to keep doing this on the side while I finish up my schooling. Worked the spring or did the school term and worked part time for them. And then full time summer did my vintage 2000 full time at Willamette as well. And then I had like, I think 21 credits to finish out that last semester of school to graduate. And I graduated uh, barely because <laughs> all of a sudden it became all that wine, not, not these degrees. Um, and so I graduated from OSU in 2001 because it was the spring um and yeah i i mean i definitely was in yeah i definitely knew that this would be the future for me mm -hmm. um which is really strange for, i think i was 21 I, you know and i didn't grow i'm not like your typical wine kid that grew up with mom and dad owning a winery at all um but i think at 21 22 i just knew this was my path so it's pretty unusual um and, you know, a lot of people will, like look at my path and hey, Gretchen, how have you made it to the top it's so early, so young? And like, I got in at a young age and, um, you know, had an incredible path, which I'm sure we'll get into in a little bit, but just, you know, opportunity to grow all the way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I guess that's how I ended up in wine. It's been <laughs> a very interesting path indeed. Yeah, not normal, right? <laughs> I'm curious about, tell me your, your initial impressions of the work. Like obviously you had a background in hard work, background in construction, you had some idea, but yeah. the actual work of a winery, the actual work in the, in the cellar and then for harvest, what, what was your impression of it? What, what about it appealed to you? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not afraid of hard work. I, I really love it actually. Um, and I love that there's variety. Like it, the, wine, the whole year in the wine cycle is changing always. And there's never, I mean, yeah, you might be washing barrels for a week or filling barrels, you know, but it changes and changes and changes. You get to see the wine evolve and change throughout the whole period. You'll find that about me through all of my work. I love variety. Um, I'm a high energy person. I like to manage lots of different things. So I love that, that ev continually evolving path. Um, I love just seeing what was happening with the wines, you know, yeah, watching all the evolution. I also love working with people. Um, I loved, 
you know, just the ability to interact with folks all day long, especially in the wine world with interns from all around the world. I love that international piece of it, um, the culture that it brought to you. That was incredible for me. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard work and there's a lot to learn, especially on the chemistry side of things, the scientific side of things like that was very intriguing to me and to be honest, still is. Like I, I, I determined early on to not become a winemaker and I'll talk about that later probably. But that part I'm still like pushing myself to learn more and more about. Um, but I don't know, I just, I love the work. I love, I love just getting my hands dirty and doing it. I have a hard time still to this day. Like yesterday we were sitting here working and you know, I just find myself on the floor just grabbing everything and jumping in with the guys to work. And I'm crouching, you need to get back in your office and take care of the high level stuff, you know, but it's just my nature to dig in. I'm not afraid of the hard work. So let's talk about that. You're, you, you've, you've kind of fallen for wine. You're, you're young. You're just, just out of college. What are you kind of envisioning at that point as, as a path? Yeah. What, what are you envisioning your career looking like? Yeah, I think my first couple of years, I didn't probably think so far ahead, but I did. I will never forget. It was the 2001 vintage. I was at Tory Moore. Um, and that was the vintage that I realized, like I said, I didn't want to get into the winemaking path. I thought that I would get into like production management and like overseeing the management of a seller. Mm -hmm. I'm really good at, like I said, kind of managing lots of balls in the air at once. Um, but I didn't, I didn't, the chemistry side wasn't as appealing to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought, well, I'll get into managing an operation. I didn't know exactly how that would, would, would play out. Um, and, you know, and then as the years went on and on, I was like, oh, well, now I want to manage a bigger operation, a bigger operation, you know, eventually work myself to the top and running a whole company. Mm -hmm. um, so that was very clear for me that I wanted to get into the business side of things. So from Willamette Valley to Tory Moore, tell me about that, that transition and, and what, what led you there and what that experience was like. Well, it was again Joe Dobbs because he was, um, Joe was the head winemaker at Willamette Valley Vineyards for those years and he eventually decided he wanted to, um, you know, move out and start to do his own thing. And so he was consulting at the time for Tory Moore um, and he's the one that said, hey Gretchen, if you... I actually had quit working at Willamette Valley Vineyards about the time I graduated. I just knew that I wanted to plant my roots somewhere else. Just was ready for the next adventure. I actually also met my husband, fell in love, and you know, did a couple other things that weren't involving wine for about a year. And then I wanted to get back into wine. So, so I took like an eight month break maybe mm -hmm. from the wine business. Um, and then Joe and I were in touch and he said, hey, I need someone at Tory Moore. You want to come over and work a vintage? I was like, great. Gives me something to do right away. Get back in the business. So I did that vintage there. Um, yeah, and it was just a seller, you know, harvest position, mm -hmm. which was really fun to do a really small operation. It was in McMinnville at the time, the old ghetto winery they used to have in town next to the rubber plant. <laughs> so weird. But um, that was an interesting vintage for sure. It was very challenging vintage. It was, yeah, really, really challenging. But um, anyway. I did that, and then after that position, because it was just a harvest gig, I don't know, it must have wrapped up in the winter time, time at some point. I actually went to work for Dell Smith and McMinnville for about one year for his agricultural operation there, Evergreen Orchards. It was a crazy thing, not at all involving wine, except for their spruce goose juice and a little bit of Pinot Noir they tried to make, and um, mostly got to travel the world with him and learn some crazy stories and flying his G3 and G4 and uh, went to China. I mean, did some really amazing things in that crazy place um, and realized once again, I wanted to be back in wine. So um, 2003, because that, yeah. So in 2003, I went to work for Joe Dobbs at Wine by Joe and Dobbs Family Estate. So kind of an interesting path in between there, trying to find my way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm curious about, before we get to Joe Dobbs, I'm curious about that experience, obviously getting getting out, getting in and out of wine. Yeah. What 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 pulled you back? Well, you know, I was gosh, my early twenties. I got married in two thousand two, so found myself married. That was working at Evergreen during that first year, um, and I mean, I, I don't know actually. I, I I just I just was doing what I was doing at Evergreen and. Um, it was fun. I mean, the traveling was fun, but um, when Joe called me and said he was starting his own company, needed one employee, um, wanted to know if I was in for it. I was, I didn't even question it. I mean, I went and interviewed with him real quick, just to mostly see the place, see where we were going to be. 
which is a funny story in itself because it totally changed. <laughs> but um, I was like, yeah, of course. I mean, I just knew Joe and I would work together so well and it would be a great path for me. So it just, I don't know, I just, that's what I wanted to do. All right, well, tell us about, tell us about the, the interview and the plan and, and what, yeah. cha what changed about it. So we actually interviewed at um, Cherry Hill Winery in 2003. That is what Joe was going to be renting. And he made a deal with Mike Sweeney. And it was going to be, you know, Dobbs and a little bit of wine from Mike on that beautiful property. I was living in um, Buena Vista, which is not too far from it. From, um, what's it called? Um, Independence. Independence, thank you. Um, so, you know, a ways away, but to Salem was really a good commute. I said, all right, Joe, I'll take the job, put in my notice, two weeks. You know, all the stuff was lining up. And by the way, this was like August, last week of August, probably. Harvest was just around the corner. He calls me up maybe like a week before I was supposed to start. And he goes, oh, by the way, we've moved. <laughs> we're not going to be in Cherry Hill. I was like, well, where are we going to be? Well, that fell through. So we're going to be at the old Tualatin Estate Vineyards property. I'm like, Joe, that's in Banks, like almost to Banks. And I live in Buena Vista. That's like an hour and a half commute. I can't work. I know how many hours I'm going to need to put in. That's not going to work for me. So I ended up, my husband and I both ended up, Mike was still at Oregon State. He was wrapping up his, his college degree. And, um, and I said, well, we'll move out of our place and get my sister's motor home, park it at the winery at Twelfth and Estate Vineyards, and literally lived at the winery. Um, we even had to like rehome our dog. I mean, it was a big deal. But it was just like, okay, we're just going to go. I mean, that probably tells you a little bit about my personality. Like, we're just going to go with it. We'll figure this out. And so we did. We moved up there, my husband and I, um, and lived in a motorhome, like literally parked on the back side of the winery um, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, Twelfth and St. Vineyards is in the boonies. Mm -hmm. um, and my husband actually, I was wrong, he had graduated from college. He had taken his first job and he traveled a lot. So he was gone most of the time. So it was just me by myself. Efren lived in the house, still lives there. Um, and some vineyard guys would come around, but we had no other employees. It was just me and Joe. And Joe lived in Salem, so he didn't come up all the time. At harvest, he was there every day. But during the rest of the year, I was there alone a lot. Um, so it was crazy living in a motorhome and, you know, just slaving away there. It was crazy. I mean, we, I literally remember. I mean, I worked probably, you know, 16, 18 hour days on average because there was nobody else to do all the work. I would just set the press at late night, set the press for the cycle, go in the motorhome, sleep for a few hours, set my alarm, get back up, empty the press and, you know, get it refilled and go back to bed. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> but, you know, I had just the best memories. It was, it was fun. Um, a lot of hard work. Um, but Joe and I had a great time. A few of the vineyard guys eventually came in to help me with some punch downs and stuff, so it wasn't just all on my back, but it was a big vintage. Um, lots to figure out with the new facility and tools that didn't work. We had to rent generators to try to make the press work properly. I mean, literally, I started on like September 9th, and like our press showed up, tanks were showing up, like, and, and grapes were in the door like two or three weeks later. I mean, it was absurd in a lot of ways, but we got it done, you know? We got it done. I was proud of it. So um, that was the beginning of a very long career path for me with, with Joe. What are some of the, uh, uh, other than the timing of course, what are some of the unique challenges of getting that kind of project started, especially being the kind of only or main employee? Yeah. Well, like I said, the press got delivered. It was this huge semi that showed up, this crane to unload. It was a big press, like a big Wilms, like probably holds about 20 tons of fruit. Big press. Uh, we realized we didn't have power to run it. <laughs> Like what? <laughs> so we had to generate, rent this huge generator, run it because there wasn't enough power up there at the winery. Like just things that Joe hadn't thought through all the way. Um, Cause we were flying by the seat of our pants. I mean, it was very much just like figure it out. Um, the glycol system that was up there was ancient, totally didn't work. I mean, we had to like just patch that thing together and then get some like mobile smaller things to, to make it work. Um, we used some big old, um, wooden fermenters that were there, two of them, that were, you know, leaking and so we had to do everything we could to tighten them up and make them work and they did. We also had a whole bunch of stainless steel fermenters we brought in. Um, it was just an ongoing project. It was just as much like logistical winemaking as it was getting this facility working and functional. So again, my skills in construction were really, really, really helpful. <laughs> I think Joe made the right choice when he could pick one employee that could wear lots of hats. Like I, I had that covered for sure. Yeah, it was just full of a lot of challenges. Um, 
but again, I, I I don't have any regrets about it. Like it was it was really fun and great, and just like this huge sense of accomplishment to be able to to just you know pull up our, our boots and make it happen. What about on the business side of things there, trying, trying, to, trying to launch a wine brand at that point? What were the, what were the challenges mm. for, on that side? You know, at that time, Joe handled all those things. That wasn't my responsibility. I was the seller person that just did what was needed in the seller. Um, Joe was launching Dobbs Stanley State brand, um, and then later, Wine by Joe was kind of an afterthought, but that came about too. Um, but I really wasn't involved with any of the initial brand work or business you know, plan set up at all. That happened later. So after the first harvest then, when you actually finally have a chance to, to kind of like settle in a little bit, what does the job look like for you at that point? And what, what, what is the kind of evolution for you there? Yeah, I, um, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, we just figured it out together, all of the winemaking pieces. And Joe ended up, you know, working at home in Salem a lot. And so we would, we had the old Nextel kind of phone walkie talkie things. Beep, beep. Hey, Joe, I'm about to do the da, 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 da. What do you want me, you know, like we just beep, beep talk back and forth and just you know I just did everything at the winery um, you know he would come up when needed to make you know wine making decisions and that kind of stuff but I really just managed the operations of keeping the cellar going um, literally I mean I'll never forget like maybe five or six months in I was like oh hey there's this thing called a 702 that we're supposed to report to the TTB um, do we have a basic permit number no we don't have a basic permit like we literally didn't have our license done. I was like, oh boy, let me figure that out, Joe. So like we got all those things just like, again, flying by the seat of our pants. But we got it figured out, we got a license. <laughs> I'll never forget that inspection, it was a little late and he, he let us slide. But we got it all done, got the reporting caught up. Like we just, I had to learn it all. We figured it out together. Um, so lots of kind of curveballs, um, but really it was all really good. The, the next major curveball that happened was um, right about Christmas time. So soon after that vintage, found out I was pregnant, which was not planned. I was married, but definitely not planning on having it, children anytime soon. And whoops, that happened. <laughs> My daughter knows, so she won't be upset to hear this. Um, and so I remember like thinking right away, like I've got to tell Joe because I'm his only employee. And you know, this is gonna be a problem because by the way, December pregnancy equals mm -hmm. a September birth. Mm -hmm. And that was gonna be a problem for the next vintage. So I was like, hey Joe, he picked me up one day cause it was too snowy, it was too slick to drive. He picked me up and I said, um, by the way, I'm having a baby. <laughs> I'm really sorry, <laughs> but this is happening. And so he hired Ann Hubach to help us out for the next vintage. So she came in and managed the harvest at the winery because I was at home. And I thought I would take six weeks off and just be right back in the cellar. And motherhood caught me by surprise and I couldn't leave my sweet tiny little baby at six weeks. So I ended up staying home a little bit longer with her. So when I phased back into the business after the birth of my first daughter, um, Ann was at the winery now managing all that wine work up at the winery and I was in McMinnville at our home. My husband and I had bought a home in McMinnville. And at that point I said, hey Joe, um, you know, there's a certain amount of business that needs to get done, like this reporting to the TTB and the OLCC and all these other things that had developed. I said, how about I help you with some of those things on a part-time basis? Cause I'm gonna ease back into this working mama thing. And he said, that's great. So I ended up working from home and at the winery as needed, kind of doing this hybrid, whatever it takes role. Um, I mean, like literally I'll never forget, like we were so frugal and so grassroots. I mean, we didn't have a server, of course, like our server was, e Joe and I would email each other like, hey, this is the most recent updated version of the file. Now you replaced your file with my file. Like we just emailed it back and forth, you know what I mean? Inventory, you name it. It was just so rudimentary and I'll never forget. Um, asking and I was so nervous to ask if I could go buy a $35 fax machine <laughs> because I was having to spend all this time going down to the store in town to like fax something and I remember saying like hey Joe do you think I could buy a fax machine you know it's gonna be like $35 <laughs> I mean it blows my mind now to think about those little things we were faced with in the beginning um, but we figured it out we just like patched it together and made it work um, so then the 2004 so the 2004 vintage was my daughter's birth um, and then 2005, I was back in the cellar in a big way with Joe and Anne and um, all of that. And then we were moving into Dundee mm -hmm. at, in 2005. So we were bringing in a new facility. So that kept me rooted in Dundee. So Anne really stayed up in Forest Grove and I ended up staying and working at the winery in, Do in Dundee. So that was great because it was close to my home in McMinnville and it kind of gave Anne a focus and I focused on Dundee with Joe. Um, and then had another baby 
in 2006. And so that was another September baby, another, another surprise, believe it or not. Like you think we would learn this, but we didn't. <laughs> uh, it turned out to be just wonderful, but at the time it was another surprise. And so, you know, Joe just worked with that. It was like, we just worked it out, we adjusted. Um, and I think after having my second child, it was really like, okay, now we have a, a big operation here. We've got two wineries, significant amount of clients. Our brands are growing, it's a big need. Um, I think at that point I probably became something like production manager. There was probably some real title at some point that gave me a focus and, you know, a clear kind of responsibility. And I think our business kind of hit a point where we were like, we have to professionalize. Like we had more people at that point. Um, and, you know, we were just figuring out how to, to, to grow together, make it all happen. Um, yeah. What a trip. I mean, I mean, I could go on and on and on with the stories. There's so many. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, tell me about the new facility. Obviously, that's that's the Dobbs that we're all we all know yeah. and, and are aware of now. So, yeah. so tell us about that process and about getting that, especially when you're kind of working at two different places or have two different places at the same time. Yeah. Tell us about getting that up to speed and, and having that become the, the facility. Yeah, for sure. So that was in 2005. We moved into the, the I call it the wooden building where Dobbs wines were made. Um, in 2007, we actually got the facility across the street where, where, where we mostly made the wine by Joe and our larger client work. Um, so in 2005, I mean, I kind of walked in midstream when Joe was um, leasing that building with Don Olson and um, I, I literally, because again, I was home on maternity leave and showed up and I was like, okay, what's happening? Um, we quickly had to like renovate the whole facility and get floor drains installed and bring in the right power and, and glycol, I know, right? Just like we're doing here at Benton Lane. Um, so it was a lot of work, and I really oversee, oversaw a lot of that construction because it was my background. Joe focused on the winemaking, a lot of the business stuff, and I focused on the facilities and remodeling, a lot of that stuff. Um, brought in the subcontractors and kind of played general contractor for the company. Um, we never used a general contractor because I could handle that pretty much. Um, and Joe was really good at it too. Like together, we really had a lot of ideas. Joe and I were very focused on efficiency, layout. You know, how can we make sure we have room for growth in the future, but make this really, um, you know well built for for growth and all that so um we had a lot of fun laying things out and you know we never hired architects or engineers for anything we just figured it out ourselves but it worked out really well so that was a big process getting that facility up and running um and it was continually evolved i mean we we continued to move things for years because as the business was growing and different clients were coming and going you know we needed different size tanks and all the things um, so we made sure all the systems were buildable, you know, glycol systems, you name it, electrical stuff. We made sure it was all expandable. But we got to the point um, where we were just busting at the seams and the facility across the street became available. And it was really more than we needed at the time, but we didn't want to lose the opportunity of having this building that was so close to us. And finally we'd have the ability to get out of Forest Grove or Banks and get our, you know, operation consolidated. So. It was heavy decision, and Joe took the risk and ultimately did it and, and leased that facility. We were kind of in a battle with a bunch of neighbors. I, I think A to Z wanted it. I think um, Argyle wanted it. I mean, we didn't battle with them directly, but the landlord was like, I got a lot of people that want this building. Um, so we had to negotiate hard, and we got it, and again, had to roll into construction mode. And that building is much bigger. It's 24,000 square feet. Um, concrete tilts up like a well-built building but didn't have the infrastructure needed for a winery. So boom, called in the contractors again and brought in big glycol chillers this time and all new floor drains and all new power. And I mean, we continue to add power even to this day, they're still adding power because it's just, you know, you just always need more. But um, big project to oversee. And so that facility really gave us a lot of relief. We had now more room than we needed, but we knew over time we would fill it all up. So, um, and along with that, the team grew. I mean, every aspect of it. Uh, our direct, direct consumer business, I don't think we opened the tasting room until, I think it was 2006. Um, maybe it was 06 we opened it as the, the um, it was called the, the Pino Station. We did it with, with Tori Moore in the beginning, and that didn't work out well. So that shut down. And then we opened it as a Dobbs tasting room. I know, I'm just... <laughs> um, we opened the Dobbs Tasting Room, I think, in 2008. And so, um, you know, we had to figure out how to do that. Like, how do you sell wine direct to consumer? <laughs> you know, so as you can see, my role just continued to develop. And I just kind of figured out all the construction, figured out all the winemaking and the production management. 
And then all of a sudden we had all these employees, so we had to learn HR, so I had to go to HR school and get certified to handle those things. So Joe was happy to be like, great, you handle that, handle that Gretchen. You handle that Gretchen. I'll focus on the winemaking, client reaction, mm-hmm. renal relations, that kind of thing, the financial stuff. Um, so little by little by little, I grew into those other aspects of the business. Um, I managed the direct consumer operation, not entirely at the beginning, but at some point it fully handed over to me, you know, and then our brands were growing in wholesale and marketing needs, all this stuff. So I just kind of slowly phased into overseeing all those aspects. Yeah. Continual growth and development for sure. And the financial side of things I think is, was like the next biggest step to really, you know, learn. What were the biggest challenges in terms of the growth of the business and, and, and kind of your role in it? You mentioned sort of clients. All of a sudden you have clients. All of a sudden yeah. you have employees. What were the biggest challenges for you and, and what did you find you were enjoying about that part of the work sort of outside, away from production, away from sort of operations management? Yeah. I think first and foremost, I love working with people. I love developing people. Like I really found managing people, managing, you know, all there is to do with people from like HR type you know deep issues but also just growth and development and tasks and all that stuff I love managing people um so that and 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 that's that's often really challenging you know and I think Joe was happy to handle all that stuff over to me because it's you know as a winemaker you're focused more on the art and the winemaking the science and all that stuff and people are it's it's hard (laughs) so that that became um clearly like I I definitely became more of a had a, a leadership role um what was the rest of the question? I'm sorry. Sort of curious about like what you what you enjoyed about it, but also sort of like what were the biggest challenges? Were, yeah. like, were there like milestones along Oof. the way when you when you like you kind of mentioned earlier? You realize suddenly we have to grow, we have yeah. to we have to professionalize. Yeah. What were sort what were sort of the the milestones along the way of growth? When yeah. You, when you had to take those big steps forward. Well, I think in addition to just people finding the right people, learning how to manage people and develop them the right. Um, the second piece, best piece or biggest piece I would say is was the financial side of things. And we, um, I was always really grateful to Joe that he didn't hire someone above me because that would have limited my growth ability. Um, I think he really saw that I had a lot of potential and he was willing to bring in consultants that I learned from. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. We brought in a consulting CFO originally, a guy from Napa, who did a great job working with us. And he came down for about a week a month. And that was a huge um, challenge for the company to wrap our head around the modeling, the future, what's the, what's the best way to go? What are, you know, there's all these options of where we could grow or not grow. And how do we get our app together to make sure we have professionalized systems on the, on the financial side? And that was a huge opportunity for me to grow and learn from him. And then eventually we hired a, a different person to do that job who's still working for the company today. He's a local guy who's a dear friend of mine and, again, a huge mentor for me. And I think, I think Joe would say the same thing, like getting your head wrapped around those financials and just mo- it was a monster. We had a big business. And, like, you know, it takes a lot of work to figure out the best path forward. Um, so I think that was a big challenge and it's, it's, it's not easy modeling things in the wine business is not easy because our inventory cycles and the costing and how it happens, like it's, it's really complex. And for us, we had, you know, Dobbs County estate and wine by Joe. We also had another brand called Jovino. We have a couple other labels that were kind of control labels or private labels. So quite a few that were our labels and then lots of different clients that were in every wine you could make in every way possible. Wine that got sold in bulk, wine that got put into their packaging, their label, Sometimes it was our packaging, their label. Sometimes it was like sliced and diced a lot of different ways. Their fruit, our fruit, really complex. So we basically did it, all of it, you know. Um, so figuring out how to like keep those financials straight and, and also, again, model that for the future was really challenging. And I love that side of things. Like I really learned a lot. Um, and, I, and I love that. So I ended up spending quite a bit of time working on those things over time. Besides, I mean, I guess along with that is, you know, the money, like, you know, getting the lending we needed, getting the, the, the money to support the growth, um, you know, keeping the bank happy and on board with what our plans were, what our vision was, what the, you know, all of that, that was, that was definitely challenging. And Joe is a, you know, a self-made guy. He had like $50,000 in his bank account when he started this business, not enough money to start a winery with, right? So we were always kind of strapped, you know? We worked really hard and very frugally. We were very resourceful. It's like totally, the Wine by Joe team is like all cut from that cloth, um, which was what we had to do. And I'm proud of what we did with with the slim resources we had. But, um, you know, 
navigating those waters was always very challenging. And ultimately, that's why Joe brought in partners, which also was a very like tipping point in the business. Um, you know, challenging for Joe to bring in partners. That's always challenging for me was a lot of growth opportunity again, because I had, again, more mentors to learn from essentially new people to report to and, and work with and new, lots of new, um, systems and expectations and reporting, you name it, all the things they brought and required of me was like a whole new, um, I guess, opportunity for growth for me. So, so I selfishly enjoyed that, you know, I'm chilly out here. This wind is chilly. I know. It feels nice to be cold, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's totally true. It's been a great, a great change, but I'm not used to being goosebumps. <laughs> so I'm curious with the, with the, with that growth was, was what happened at, at, at Why My Joe and Dobson My State, was that what was anticipated going in or was the growth of the growth model kind of change as you were going through it? Well, if you know Joe Dobbs, um, there's a lot of shooting from the hip. I mean, you know, it was... It was, an, we were nimble and rolled with it a lot. Um, and, you know, part of it is when you work in custom winemaking, you're at the mercy of your clients and what they want to do. Um, and they came and go, and a lot of it was, you know, not exactly well projected. Because a lot of it's hard to project. Our own branded goods were much more solid and much more, you know, predictable and um, all of that. But the client stuff was hard. Um, you know, you could have a client that was a big bulk client just change you know go away for some reason or or a new one come in so you would see lots of swings in the business i'm forgetting the other half of your question i think just sort of curious about the if, if the growth was was what, what yeah. was anticipated when you started or if, if it was yeah i can't say we had clarity around that i mean again we kind of rolled with it we moved into one facility in the next and um it's it's yeah i, I don't i don't know that there was a lot of planning behind that it just kind of happened as it happened <laughs> So tell me about the, the, the for that, that kind of career part for you at that point. What mm -hmm. what were the next steps for you, and what was sort of the final result? Where did you sort of end up at, at, at the in the Dobbs co fam family yeah. company there? Totally. Well, I mentioned that we brought on partners, and um, you know that was a big shift for me, and it allowed me to learn a lot of new things, um, and I, and I did. I enjoyed it. Um, the ability to connect with Rob Roop, who is um, wicked smart in the financial world. He lives in New York City. He's like London School of Economics grad. Like, I learned a lot from Rob. He was really, really cool um, and good friends with him still today. Sam Bronfman was, you know, one of the partners and um, just a great guy, like heir of the Seagram's company. Like, the stuff that he's experienced, the stories he shared with me, really enjoyed my time with Sam and learned a lot from him. Um, and the other partners as well. Like, there were, they were um, new people for me to learn new things from. That's one of the key reasons, or probably the primary reason I stayed around so long. I was there 17 and a half years, which was pretty unheard of for an employee. I was never an owner there, just an employee, to stay with a company that long. It was because I was continually being fed with growth opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, Joe really believed in me. He knew I was a fast learner and he knew I was a hard worker. Um, and so as long as I had, you know, new challenges and new people to help me keep learning and keep upping my game, I stayed engaged. So... You know, the partners brought that to me as well. Um, and then ultimately, Joe retired from the business um, three and a half, four years ago. I guess it was um, about, it was 2016, like August or September of 2016. Um, and so there was a year where Anthony Van Nice came in and actually um, was the CEO of the company. And it was an incredible opportunity for me as well to like finally have a different leader on, in the house every day. And I really enjoyed my time with Anthony. He was there for a, about a year, maybe it was about a year. And um, it was a huge changing point for me because I kind of was had a new person to validate myself against. And he really helped me a lot. Um, just a new person to think with, you know, a new person to collaborate with and bounce ideas off of and help me kind of, you know, confirm, yeah, that's right. No, that's not right. And just the way we had done things with Joe's leadership was one way and it wasn't always the right way. I mean, you know, there is no right way. It's just, it just was, it was a new way. So I really enjoyed that. Um, and I'll never forget, like this was like a, a moment that I appreciated so much from Anthony when he decided to leave. Um, he came to me and said, Gretchen, you're one of the most competent people I know in this industry. And that meant so much to me, just because I'd always worked under really Joe and, and some of the Bacchus guys, you know, but to have someone from the outside work side by side with me for a full year and then kind of validate that I 
that I had a few things going on, like I was like, wow, that's really cool. I mean, I'm a really humble person. And um, it just was like a, a moment for me to say, you know, being competent, like that's a that's a powerful word for me because I I pride myself in like like I've said hard work like I can fix about any like I'm I'm competent at a lot of things and that that feels really good to me like I don't know I mean you can be a great winemaker you can be great at many many things but um, I don't know the word competent I guess just like it's capable and competent like I can do I can do almost anything I mean I'm not gonna say I do anything perfect by any means I'm far from perfect but. I don't know. I haven't told you my whole dad story yet, but my, my, my dad raised me with this slogan, my girls can do anything. And I actually have it tattooed down my side. Like it was what words I was given my whole life and my two sisters as well. And, um, my mom modeled that for us that women can do anything. And my dad, like there was no limitations put on me because of my, my gender ever. I mean, I worked in construction with dudes all the time. Like that's what I did. Um, we went hunting, we went on packing trips in the, in the woods, you name it. I mean, like we did everything, everything was an open invitation. My brother also, like he got to do, we all got to do whatever we wanted. And my girls can do anything was like the words dad said to us. And, um, you know, when Anthony said that you're, you know, you're really competent. I was like, I don't know. It just was like really validating. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I really have always believed, of course I can do anything. I can learn show me, give me the teacher I need, you know what I mean? Support me and I can learn it. I'll figure it out. But I also know my, my limitations. Like I said, the chemistry side, like, no, thank you. (laughs) Like you guys go handle that. Making those final blending decisions. No, thank you. Like I'll help figure out how to sell it, how to cost it, how to manage the people that need to go get that done. But your palette's way better than mine. Like, that's great. You go do that part. Um, you know, so I think having that combined, um, humility with like knowing where you are competent and where you're strong and where you're not and willing to hire and help the people figure out those sides. It's like a really neat Mm -hmm. balance to find. And I, I I definitely found that about then. So anyway, Anthony was with us for that year. It was really good. And, and you know, to be totally honest, I was ready to have that job, but I wasn't because I was Joe's, I'd worked under Joe for so long to then be in charge of the company so quickly would have been a a weird shift. And I mean, I'll skip some of the details of why, but it was just, it was a challenging time for us in the business and the partnership. And it was just an uncomfortable time for Joe and for me and for everybody there. And so Anthony coming in, um, at first I was like, damn it, I want that job. They're hiring this guy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I had to just like, you know, tuck my pride away and say, make the best of the scratch and it makes you learn from him. And it turned out to be a total blessing. Like it really was. And I've used that example to employees of mine since then. In fact, when I left Wine by Joe and took this job where I'm at now, a lot of my employees were in tears. Gretchen, what are we going to do without you? Who's coming in? What if he's some big jerk? What if this? What if that? Or she is a, you know, what? And I said, take it as an opportunity. It's going to be uncomfortable. I know it. I've been in those shoes. It's a new leader to learn from. Like just, just keep your chin up. It'll be good for you in the end. I promise you. And it's totally working out that way, you know? So it was a great lesson to learn. Um, anyway, after that, when Anthony gave the notice that he was moving on, he went over to work for Laurent, and it's been great for him there. Um, they came to me, the partners, and said, Gretchen, are you ready? You ready to run the company? I said, yes, 100%. <laughs> you know, so Joe and I had a little talk and just made sure we were in agreement with how things were going to go and um, that we were going to, you know, my, my one stipulation was we're going to have fun, like we're going to get along. Like there's some challenging dynamics here between the partners. Um, and I'm not going to be miserable in the middle of that. So here's the game rules and everybody agreed. Let's all get along. Let's make this great. Let's have fun. And so from that point forward, um, I was the CEO of the company, which is a title that I always thought was kind of dumb. It's very corporate. You know, I said top, top slave. Like I just worked hard, you know, I just did whatever we needed to do, but I just had that, that dumb title. But Anyway, um, you know, finally made it to the top and was in charge of every aspect of the business at that point. So that was, um, I guess that that was the 20, that was at the beginning of, or the end of 2016. Um, so anyway, ran the business from that point forward and, you know, wow, what a crazy ride it was the last several years. I mean, so much pressure on my back without, you know, anybody else to, you know, 
blame it on kind of thing. It was really, really intimidating. It took me a while to get comfortable with it, to be totally honest. Uh, but we did great things. We really, really worked hard. I think the biggest thing that I did there um, right away was change the transparency and the openness with my top management team. I formed a management team of all my top people. There was eight of us, I think. And we got into the room around a table just like this and I shared everything with them. Here's our financials. Here's everything. Here's all the ugly things that we couldn't really talk about before. But I'm going to be totally open with you guys because I need you to help me figure out the best way forward. So I changed that culture um, to make it very open and um, try to encourage a culture where we could openly debate things in the room together and say, yeah, no, I don't know, like it took to come to the right decision. Um, and just got everybody thinking and, 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 you know, understanding like, what are the challenges? What's the best way forward? Let's, let's figure this out together and developed a sense of team. That is, um, really important to me in my leadership style as team. And I really got that team developed. So we had to make some changes, a few roles, a few people, and we got that team singing and we were all really aligned and the magic started to happen. It was really, really an incredible transformation. After that many years working at the, at the company, what, what were the biggest either, either surprises or, or sort of like unexpected challenges of actually finally being at the top? Were there things that you, you weren't, weren't anticipating having to deal with that you now had to deal with or, or parts of the company you weren't very familiar with yet? Um, I mean, there's lots. <laughs> um, I think probably the wholesale side of the business was the most challenging. We at, at Wine by Joe always used an agency for wholesale, um, which is a unique model. Some people use agencies. Some people do it in-house. Um, sorry, I'm chilly. Um, so it was, it's, it's difficult. I mean, whole, the wholesale world is, is challenging and, um, if you're in this unique spot of like not not big enough to have a big team and you're you're we're in that middle zone of size if you're small enough you can just kind of focus on a few key markets and have a few employees that are handling that and do a lot of it yourself that's one thing but we were like big enough in 50 states but we couldn't afford a whole internal team to like well cover the united states with with a staff of our own we tried it a few times and it just didn't work well so I think managing agencies was really, really challenging because, um, you know, they're not dedicated to just you. They're working for you and a lot of other brands. Um, and yeah, it was just, there was, I mean, I could get into all the details, but that was probably one of the biggest surprises was how hard it was to navigate all that and to get that solved. Um, and, you know, we also had just some poor luck in there. Like we had like one agency, like sold and so we were suddenly with a new agency because that's who bought them and you know like just things like that you're just like dang it this wasn't the plan this isn't how it's supposed to go but that was out of our control mm -hmm. so that's a, an ongoing challenge for the company is to figure out the wholesale side of things it's i mean for probably most people in wholesale mm -hmm. it's very hard and there's a lot of i mean there's a lot of challenges it's it's not easy you know the wine business especially you know the way we were playing with custom wine making and bulk wine sales and you know wine by joe being more value price like it's a slim margin business. You have to be really, really mindful of dollars and pennies to make it, you know, make sense. So there was always, always something. Before we get on to your next move, I'm curious about sort of work in the industry outside of outside of the business. Obviously, part of uh, multiple boards, multiple organizations. So tell me about some of the some of the things you've done, sort of service to the industry. Uh, some of the places you've you've worked in, and some of the kind of the contributions you feel you've made through the through that work. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because I think about that same time I took over the company for my management company, my management group. We sat around this table and we said, we need to contribute more to this industry as a company. We recognize that the company, um, our positioning within the local industry wasn't as high as we wanted it to be because. Well, we felt like one of the problems was that we hadn't contributed. Like we really wanted to, be, I wanted our company to become more part of the community. And we very intentionally sat down as a management team and like, I'll never forget, we had this big dry race board and we wrote out every single um, group that mattered. You know, IPNC, OPC, WBWA, you know, OB, the Oregon Wine Board, you name it, all the things, every single, group or event or board that 
um, was around and we said, these matter, who can get involved and try to get involved with anything out of this top 10 or 20 list? So we were very strategic about that. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep shudder, shivering here. It's cold. Um, and so for me personally, I was like, you know, we sign, you know, certain people to certain groups and each of them it took it upon themselves to try to get involved and, you know, eventually did and got into some of those board level positions. And for me, I did. Um, and I guess prior to that, like it just wasn't a priority for the company and we didn't have time. I mean, I think with that whole bootstrapped thing, like there just wasn't spare time really to give back, which I totally understand, but I also think it was a miss. Oh, I'm like shivering. I'm sorry. Um, so I think it was a miss because um, it's important to get back. So anyway, at that point really was my first time doing much outside of the company. And I jumped in first with the WV, no, no, sorry, the DHWA, Dundee Hills Wine Guard Association. And served on that board for like four or five years, I think. And, you know, did what I could to help, help their mission and help... Um, you know, continue to make the Dundee Hills like just really known as that preeminent wine growing place and it's really important group and great AVA to be a part of There's so many other amazing brands. I enjoyed my time getting to know um, the members and our other board members really well. It was really awesome. Um, actually, I ended up ha- handing those reins over to Sarah Pearson, who's now running the company um, and she's doing a lot of really good work for the Dundee Hills Wine Growers Association on the marketing side in particular. Um, so that's been, I think, great. Um, then I, um, I guess next, ended up doing some work with the, and this is all pretty recent, with the um, OWA and the OWB. Um, I'm sorry, not OWB, the OWC, but the Oregon Wine Growers Association. I ended up helping them just like on the bylaws committee, helping them rewrite their bylaws as they've broken off now from the OWB. Um, and so I, I helped them on some committees with, with that, um, which I have to say was very challenging because bylaws, writing bylaws is like, whole oh, talk about in the weeds details. And I hadn't done that before. So I found it hard to feel like I was really contributing much, but I learned a lot, <laughs> but I didn't, I don't know. It was, it was challenging for me because it was my first time mm-hmm. getting so in those weeds of bylaws, mm-hmm. but it was important work, certainly important work for the industry. And I was happy to be a part of it. And I, again, the learning opportunity was really great. I ultimately also was involved with the Oregon Wine Council, um, and I'm no longer on that board, but um, helped the Oregon Wine Council kind of get established and ultimately really help push and help make a lot of those changes happen with the separation of the OWB and the OWA, which is all a very um, touchy subject. Um, it's very challenging to work through, and it was uncomfortable for me in a lot of ways because I guess... In my heart, I'm a peacemaker. Like, it's kind of the mother in me. It's kind of the leader in me. Like, being the head of a company, being the head of a household. Like, it, I, I, that's just who I am. I'm always like, let's get along. Let's work this out, you know. And I found my role at the OWC very much like, oh, man, can't we just all get in the room and hug and talk this out and just work it out? And it's just not that easy, right? So, um, anyway, we, we, got, we got a lot of things done. I do think some of the things that were done were very important. Um, I think it's going to set up the industry for a, um, a much better future, having the OWA focused on what they need to focus on and o- OWB on their piece, making sure it's more equitable um, for the mem- members um, because one is a members, you know, driven association and one is not. One is tax paid, pair funded, and it should be equal to them for everybody. So that's going to be much more appropriate now. I think it's really important work. Um, anyway. Lots of stuff, lots of time spent on those calls. Holy cow, that was a lot of time. Um, and I think it's good, but I, but it is kind of a relief now to be off of those things because I'm focused on this new job here at Benton Lane. And A, I had to pull out because we're not a member of the OWC. But um, I just have so much to focus on here. It's like, I gotta go back to like 100% focus on this estate and this project now. And eventually I'll get myself right back into Um, some involvement in other groups and I'll do the same thing here with my team and get us all involved locally and all that but I got to get this building literally built first (laughs) and once that's done we'll start to branch out to other things you know well let's take a step back then before we get to that and tell me about the decision to come here in the first place what 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 brought you to Mint Lane yeah I mean it's it's really um you said at the beginning, you know, it's, it's a shocker to a lot of people like Gretchen Benton Lane, like scratching their heads, like what, you know, and me too. I mean, I will be super honest. And I've told, um, my employers now that when I got the call 
which was about Christmas time of this last year, I got a call from a headhunter saying, I've got this opportunity, Gretchen. I think you're going to want to look at it. And I was like, oh, I've never looked at another job. Like, I've been with this company that I just adore for 17 and a half years. And I was like, you know, I should probably just learn how to take an interview because <laughs> I've never done that. <laughs> I mean, not since like college. So I was like, I guess I'll just, for like, why not? I'll take an interview like I should. And it sounded kind of intriguing, the description. Um, so I took the first interview and I was like, well, that was cool. I learned something. We'll see where that goes. I mean, I had no idea. I was not looking for a job. Um, and as the interviews continued, it was actually a three month interview process to come here. It was a long time, which I was so grateful for because I couldn't have made the decision quickly to leave Wine by Joe because it was so ingrained in me. It was who I was in so many ways. And so I was so grateful that Hunayas Vintners and Nick, Nick Withers, the CEO, took his time with me and um, really made it kind of a gentle approach to make sure I was slowly getting on board and getting comfortable with his idea. And over those three months, I fell in love with the company who I'm working for now, Hunayas Vintners. Um, Nick's the CEO, he's awesome. The management team there that I'm working alongside with are incredible people. And little by little by little, I got to interview all of them. I even got to go down to California for a day and spent like an eight hour day interviewing with various people there. And at the end of that three month process, I was like, I want this job. I really want this job. And that it took time, you know, if they had did your typical two interviews, here's a job, I would have been like, I can't, I, it's too, it would have been uncomfortable for me. So super grateful for that. Um, ooh, sorry, I keep shivering. Um, so I took the job because of many things. Benton Lane, yeah, it'll scratch your head, right? Like, I live in Newburgh. This is in Monroe. It's an hour and 45 minutes from my home. I'm not moving. I made that very clear in the process. Um, they didn't require me to move. Like, we learned through COVID that you can work from anywhere and do a job, you know, really well remotely. And it's still reasonable driving distance. So I, I come down here and I actually built myself a little apartment. So I stay here a night or two a week because I don't like the drive. Uh, but I do, do the rest of it from home and it's totally fine. I'm building out my dream team here. I'll get into those details later, but I'm um, definitely building a team here that will just own this place and take care of it so I don't have to worry when I'm in Newburgh. Um, but I took the job because of Huneus. They're an incredible company. We are an incredible company. Um, family owned, well resourced, long term vision very successful track record if you've seen what they've done in California with Quintessa of course is the foundational incredible incredible estate um, flowers and Faust uh, and flowers oh my gosh incredible incredible vineyard estate out on the Sonoma coast I've, I've gotten to go there twice now and see all the properties in depth um, in, I mean, mind-blowing beautiful challenging I mean talk about pioneers of the Sonoma coast like wow it's amazing to see the flowers estate but they they also just built a brand new visitor center for Flowers, brand new um, visitor center. Well, it's a remodeled old, old, old building for Faust. Um, and they've got two other brands called Leviathan and Illumination. And then they just bought a new property to um, just right behind Opus One. It's gonna be the next thing that they're working on right now. I've just seen the initial work on it that Rodrigo's working on, it's incredible. So this exciting track record of doing really cool things. Um, I just knew that this company has success, they have vision, they're family owned. Like I've, I saw what they did and I was like, we can do some really cool things in Oregon. So when I looked at Benton Lane, I actually came down here, it was closed and nobody knew I was interviewing. So like I literally, my husband, and I snuck through the gate and looked, all the, looked through all the windows of all the buildings. And I was like, whoa, there's a lot more happening at Benton Lane than I thought. Like I really, in my mind, I had never been here before. Like that's how off my radar it was. I had never been here before, but I was like blown away when I came here. I discovered these beautiful buildings, 140 acres of vineyard that's incredible. If we had time today to show you it all, it's incredible. Um, I drove around that vineyard and I was like, oh my gosh, we've got so much to work with here. And what I've discovered since then, I'll tell you about later, but it's incredible. Um, beautiful estate with this beautiful property, just like this incredible sense of place lot of space room for expansion I mean I know I, I know what to do how to expand as we need it for the future um, I was like there's some really good bones here and I knew I saw that 
with Huneus's track record and excellence in fine wine sales and wholesale across the country. And, you know, I knew the direct consumer side of things really well, as do they. So I knew together with their marketing support um, that we could just do great things together. Um, I really think this is a special place. And I know, I mean, I know it. And um, the team of people that I've, I've hired now to help me um, all see it too. In fact, I mean, I was interviewing for winemakers and um, they just kept coming out of the woodworks. Because people are always looking for a new opportunity of a new winemaking role, like it's a big deal. And I enjoyed the process so much. I think I interviewed directly 12 different winemakers and probably talked to 20 in total. Um, almost all, I mean, I think all of them were just like, wow, I totally see it. I see the potential here. It was really like strength, you know, re- renewed my strength in, in the potential here. Um, Ultimately, I just hired Vince Vadreen, and he's incredible. I'm super pumped to get him here. He's, he's not going to be here full-time for a little bit, but um, he's helping me a ton already, and he'll be here full-time soon. And, I mean, he's just, he sees it just like I do. Like, so I'm building this dream team um, with Vince as the winemaker and Bethany Reed as my director of hospitality, and we're building out the rest of the team beneath them. But we're going to do big things. I, I really um, – I know that we're going to get this estate back on the – back on the – the eyes of people. Um, Huneas has the ability in wholesale across the country to, and in fact, they've already had tons of success with it since they bought it in 2018. The, the brand has just grown and grown and grown across the country. It's just here in Oregon, a little dusty. And so we're going to just get it um, brought back to life, remodeling things inside the taste room right now, um, definitely modernizing things, giving it a good, fresh t- look for today. We're working on quality um, in winemaking, quality in the vineyard, just driving all anything we can do to improve. Mm-hmm. Um, and really our mission here is to discover this, this estate. We are digging in, literally digging into the dirt deeply and looking at, I mean, if you... I'm pointing at the vineyard here, but we, we start about 800 and some feet all the way down to about 300 feet of elevation, 140 acres. It faces um, north, south, and east, and, you know, kind of rolls back and forth. We've got 130 acres of Pinot Noir, 10 acres of Chardonnay, basically all the clones. We're about 70% um, jory, jory soil, uh, but then a mix of a couple other things in there as well. Um, but it, it varies a lot. But we're layering these EC maps showing the electroconductivity of what's happening below the soil with the soil maps, with the elevation and different you know, um, ways the vineyard is facing, with the clones, with the elevation. Like there's so much going on here that we're just now entering this phase of discovery and really going to find these really special micro terroirs, if you will, within this large 140 acres. And so as we're gearing up for this coming vintage, we're like literally dissecting the vineyard. We just bought a whole bunch of tiny fermenters. So we can keep this little thing separate from that little thing, from that little thing, and discover all these little unique pockets within the vineyard and figure out what really is special here. So we can eventually um, dial in exactly which wines we're going to make for special unique offerings within direct consumer and all that. Um, so it's going to be a huge process of discovering exactly what this vineyard can do and how far we can push quality and um just making it really really special so it's it's going to be an incredible journey i've got the right team with with vince at the top to lead that process um jose our venue manager has been here for 24 years he lives in the house at the top of the property like this is his his property you know he he loves this and he takes care of it he does an incredible job taking care of the land um so together i really feel like yes we are off the beaten path we're kind of right between Corvallis and Eugene. That is the challenge, but we're going to drive this and turn this property into a real destination so that people um, are going to want to come here and stay for a while because it's, it's going to take a while to get here. There's a lot of people in Corvallis and Eugene. Um, and we're going we're gonna to bring in animals out here. We're going to bring in some really cool culinary. That's a loud log truck. That one might show up on the microphone. <laughs> um, we do have a highway down there. It's, it's an old country road, but there's every once in a while somewhere that drives by. But um, it's a beautiful property, and I think when we really, really bring it to full life out here, um, we've got this great pizza oven right here, and we've got some gardens we just planted. We'll bring in food off of the garden into our pizza oven, you know, and get some animals that are both working in the vineyard as well as, you know, doing a job here on the property. Um, you just bring life back to it and make it a great destination that people are going to want to come and stop and hang out for a while. Um, we've got 
plenty of room to host lots and lots of people. So it's going to be a really fun challenge. Um, I believe with the marketing and just getting that word out and bringing back the, you know, the right story and breathing that life into this, this, this estate, it's going to, people are going to realize how special it is. So that's why I'm here. That's a long answer to that question. It's a very good answer to that question. <laughs> Tell me about the, the vision as it was laid out to you during the kind of interview process of, of what, what, what was expected, what was hoped for here, and, and kind of how long-term the vision is for this place. Yeah. Um, you know, they were Nick's style is exactly what I love in leadership style. It's totally transparent. Um, the culture at Huneas is very... Um, humble but confident which I really love and I felt that right away in them and they have clear vision at the same time they know and recognize that they don't they're not Oregon experts and that's why it was important them to them to hire an Oregonian I'm a native Oregonian and that was like top priority for them was someone that was a local person that was going to do it the right way in Oregon because they certainly are professionals at what they do in the fine wine space but not an Oregon pro so um, they have said to me, this is what we think the vision is, kind of what I just described, bring this back to life, let's, let's get to know this vineyard in detail, explore it and really find the special, special spots and let's just drive quality. Like, but they've also said, there are no sacred cows. Like, we could change anything you need to change, Gretchen. Like, you need to get there, discover it, be a part of it, um, and we'll figure it out together. So like, I love that they have I mean, they, they have a, I mean they, they've all been here many times with me. In fact, Rodrigo's coming back on Tuesday. Like, they've flown up a lot to be with me and support me through this, and I've been down there a bunch. Um, I know exactly what they have done in California, so I have a, a model a bit to follow, but at the same time, they know that it may or may not be perfectly right for Oregon mm-hmm. and for Benton Lane. So um, I feel like I've given, been given just enough guidance, but not like, here's the box you have to fit in. Mm-hmm. It might be like this, but you can go as you need to, and you're going to discover it. In fact, Nick keeps telling me, like, Gretchen, stay slow. You can see I have a lot of energy. I like to do things quickly. Slow down and just, like, absorb it. Live here. Be a part of it. I mean, I literally do live here sometimes. I come out at night, and I sit on this patio, and when I'm finally ready to be done working at, like, 9.30 p.m., have a glass of wine, and I'm, like, living here and feeling it. And soon we're going to host consumers here and get to pour wine for people and see what they're saying about our wines, see what stories they're telling me about the past here and see how I start to deliver the story to them. And so it's slowly going to come together. Our new story, our new vision is slowly going to come together as I'm here and living it myself. So I love that. I love that there's not restriction, but there's also, you know, there's a lot of ideas. I mean, they've had a lot of great ideas and many of them I've taken, you know, but some of them I'm like, yeah, but a little bit, let's, you know, and they're like, great. You know, so it's working really, really well. Um, the cultural fit for me is is perfect, and um, yeah, I just I really truly know it, and I know that we're gonna have big success here. So I'm thrilled for it. I'm thrilled. I mean, for me, after 17 and a half years of the same company, and really almost my entire career working with Joe, um, making a change was really um, uncomfortable and challenging. But like I said, after the three month period, I was like, I want this job, mm-hmm. and I'm just thrilled to be here. I know it's gonna be an incredible next step for me to fill in a few of my gaps and help me become more of a fine wine professional um, and just learn from a whole different team of people that, that have so many skills when you put it together and look at the people that are running their California operation. Like, they're amazing. So it's, it's also very selfish. I'm going to learn and grow, and I'm thrilled for that, but I'm also going to contribute a lot to this, to this organization. And that's important to me. So when you... When you did look at this, when you decided to take this, tell me about prioritization for you with all of the things you're talking yeah. about before. How do you prioritize and what's, and what, again, what's sort of the, 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 the timeline of things coming online? Yeah. Well, yes. Um, very, very clearly, um, I spent the first week, my very first day on the job, I flew to California and I spent a week with them. I toured every property, every vineyard, I tasted with every single winemaker and I got a really good foundation underneath me. And my second week I came back and I got to my Excel file and created my 30, 60, 90. Cause like there was just so many ideas. And then they came here. I think it was that third week. And then more ideas were generated. And then I was like, just like going to drown in ideas and to do's. Right. So I, I knew I had to get myself organized and prioritized. So it was really clear, probably like five things, taste room remodeled, like get the building done. We had been shut down since COVID since the beginning of COVID. 
Pune has decided they can't run this place from California. They knew they needed to hire an Oregonian to run the operation, but through COVID, it was just not the right timing. They couldn't even get here for an interview, right? So they just shut it down. They were making wine, three employees in the cellar making wine, but the tasting room was completely shut down. So Jose was managing the vineyard, three guys in the cellar, that's it. So I walked into a building that hadn't been open for 18 months, cobwebs, filthy, you name it. So job one, what's the remodel plan? What are we doing? Who's the contractor? All that stuff. Ooh. <laughs> um, and hire my staff for the tasting room, starting with my top, Bethany, who I landed. And third piece, winemaking. Get to know my winemaking team, you know, all that. Fourth priority, vineyard. And these aren't, they're all top, top, top priority, equal priority. You know, get to know Jose and this property, these 140 acres of vines, you know, get my head wrapped around that. Um, and the fifth one, which I don't think Nick wanted on my list right away, but I kept trying to get it onto my top five, was marketing because I knew that I was gonna get, you know, vineyard and winemaking, just singing as fast as I could, get the taste room remodeled, get my staff in, and then I needed to get the word out to people that were open, right? So I haven't been able to spend much time on that fifth priority yet. Um, I'm, I'm barely, barely spending a tiny bit of time on it, but we have a lot to do with website and social and all the stuff, emails, oh my gosh, there's so much to learn. But um, it's a lot. I mean, it's every aspect of the business I'm looking at and potentially revamping, maybe not, maybe so, like everything is as, as possible, you know? So I just um, focus on those few things. And then I found myself, my to-do list, some days gets really super long and I'm like, nope, f get these, just focus on these few things, Gretchen. You can't get too deep in the weeds on some stuff. So it's hard for me to be totally honest because I'm the type of person that likes to just overachieve. I'm like, I'm very driven, I'm competitive. Like I like to, I like to, to really do good for my boss, right? And my, my company, my people, my team, everybody. I like I have really high expectations of myself. And some things aren't exactly on time. Some things aren't exactly like, oh, I wish I could do more there. I wish I was more involved with that. But I have to also give myself a little grace. Like, I'm new. I'm new and it takes time. So I'm adjusting to that and figuring that out. My husband is incredible. He talks me off the ledge when I call him on the way home. I'm like, Mike, you know, I want to do everything right right now. And he's like, Gretchen slow down it's okay like stop you know and and Nick is incredible and the team at Hanea's they are so supportive and understanding Rodrigo is another one just like constantly just helping me focus on um you know what matters so it's really great it's great well we, we brought up 2020 a couple of times during this conversation and obviously you, you changed jobs during 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 the pandemic but I'm curious about backing up just a little bit to the beginning of the pandemic last spring uh, still at Wine by Joe at that point. Tell me about sort of initial reactions to to that and, and the sort of profession, personal and professional reactions and the and the adjustments you had to make last year to, to yeah. get through. Oof, what a challenging time. I mean, it still is, right? But it's just different today. But yeah, I mean, you know, at Wine by Joe, I had an incredible team. I mean, I built an incredible team of people. Um, some of them were there. Most of them were there when Joe was there and a few new people too. Um, so really, when everything started hitting with the pandemic, we just sat down as a management team and divided and conquered. What are we gonna do? We formed a, ma a COVID team, because you know, we're rolling right into harvest. How are we gonna handle this through harvest, guys? What are we gonna do? So we just, I had this incredible team of managers that really just created protocols. Carrie, my HR director at the time, now she's the GM. She just like handled it from like the, you know, liability, the legal side. Stayed abreast of all the ever-changing rules. Uh, Tracy was head of all of direct consumer. She just like, I mean, just nimble, change, 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 and stayed on top of it and made sure we were doing the right thing in the tasting room. We made all the changes that everybody did, right? We were shut down for the longest time and then opened up for curbside, all the things, slowly got guests back in, followed the rules, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was just so challenging on so many ways. One of the rules I created for myself, because, well, I mean, I just, the rule I created for myself was you got to meet people where they are. Because people range, it's just like politics today. You might be from here to here, you know, left to right. In COVID, you might be ultra scared, not scared at all. It's not real. I mean, you, people are all over the boards. No one's right or wrong. As a manager, you have to just look at it and say, I get it. You're struggling for these reasons and you're scared for these reasons. And you're not scared at all for these reasons. You know, I just had to meet people where they were. And so that was kind of a, a early rule I had to adopt for myself and turn off my own personal feelings and just, you know, try to be open to that and make the best of it. Um, you know, we all switched and worked from home primarily. So that, that 
you know, was good and bad. I mean, ultimately really that is probably one of the key reasons why I was open to taking this job because had I not worked from home for so long and if Hune has called me and said, hey, we want to hire you and work from, I would be like, work from home? What? Who does? You know what I mean? <laughs> like crazy. It's crazy. Who would do that? Like I'm with people every day. It's what I do. You know, like I never would have contemplated this job probably if it weren't for COVID. So I'm grateful for that. <laughs> Maybe one of the only things. Um, but we just, I, I think again, at Wine by Joe, that team there, nimble, you know, just really resourceful. Like that had the company well positioned to adjust quickly, you know? And I think that um, we really excelled. Um, I was so proud of our team for just pulling up the bootstraps, figuring it out, rolling with the punches, being open. Carrie, again, our new, now GM, was in charge of HR, still is in charge of HR too, but she just, she had to bear all the weight of it. I mean, she had to like hear people one-on-one, like, uh, you know, crying and worried, all the things. Like it was so much weight for her to have to deal with. Um, so I have thankfully was one layer removed from that, but it was hard, super hard, but you know, we got through it. Why my did a good job. I mean, the company did really well through all of it. Um, our direct consumer business killed it. I mean, really did great. I mean, the team at, at Dobbs, um, are incredible. Tracy runs it. I mean, Sarah, Sarah Pearson now is the CEO of the company, but she was in charge of sales and marketing at the time. So it was under Sarah's leadership and Tracy's leadership that they just adjusted and adjusted and figured out how to sell wine. We luckily had about a year prior to that done all the foundational work to fix our e-commerce. Had no idea the pandemic was coming, but we worked out every little kink. So our e-commerce business was really um, well positioned to handle that switch over into so much e-com. And I mean, the growth we experienced through e-com was incredible. But had we not done that foundational work to fix a bunch of the back end problems that we had, that we didn't even know we had, we would have we wouldn't have been able to pivot and have success there but that was done so there several key things that um just enabled us to to survive it all and the company did really well through it so i was really thankful for that um we got through harvest without any issues in terms of any key em- not any employee not a single no one had it not a single intern not a single winemaker anything but we were prepared for the worst um and really followed the rules tightly um it was hard but we got through it you know what else? Well, you mentioned harvest of 2020 as well. Obviously, a whole other challenge last harvest as well with, with the fires and the smoke. So tell me, oh, about, t- tell me about those adjustments as, as long as we're talking about 2020. and this For climate. sure. Let's just talk about all the problems all, all the at once. All the <laughs> Yeah. I mean, whoever would have thought. What a year, right? Um, I think 2020 is some of the most notable things. And, and, I, and thankfully, not to like toot my own horn, but I really leaned on my skills that I had about production. You know, I had worked... I didn't even think I said this to you yet, but in my 17 and a half years there, all but probably the last three or four, I worked the harvest still. Even as I shifted and got into the business and ran the business, I still came down to the floor and ran a harvest shift um, until the last three or four years. Because at that point, the business had grown so big. We had enough winemakers that they could handle it, and I didn't have to put my boots on at harvest anymore. Um, And I missed it in a lot of ways, but the business was so big, I couldn't abandon the business to go run Crush. So... But I have probably worked at least 15 harvests in my life or something like that. So, you know, I was like, holy cow, we have fire and smoke in the Lava Valley. I mean, my home in particular, I live right at the base of the Shale Mountains. We had our bags packed. We ended up not having to evacuate. All my neighbors did. I'm actually in the county there in the town. The town people got the call and evacuated. We didn't get the call, even though I live right next to them. It was crazy. But anyway, it was fine. My husband slept on the deck and like watched the fire coming down, like right below David Adelson's house, like he was watching and you know, direct view. So we were fine, but we were packed. Nightmare. I mean, as a mom of three children, my kids, we were scared. It was awful. Awful. Um, again, this team at Wine by Joe, like just grit is the word we used at Wine by Joe. And like, that is like just the best way to describe that team. Like incredible grit, just incredible ability to just roll with it, do what it took. I don't think a single employee didn't come to work in that smoke, which maybe was breaking some OSHA rules. And now those are clear rules, but back then those rules didn't exist, (laughs) but everybody was there. Everybody was like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I was like, holy cow, set aside the business. I got on the phone with every grower and you know, first with my team and I said, all right, you guys figure out this micro ferments. You guys figure out this. I'll take care of the growers. And I got on the phone with every grower and our lawyers and tried to figure out how are we going to survive this? How are we going to figure out what we're bringing in and what we're not bringing in? Do we reject or not reject? And how do you pay for it? And what do you do? What's the right thing to do? Oh, it was heavy. It was so heavy. Um, but 
I was so grateful that I could just talk that talk. I knew what to do. Like I totally knew what to do. So we worked it through and, um, we did have a few things that we ended up not bringing in. Thankfully those growers were the ones that had crop insurance. So no wonder he was left empty. Um, and we found a way to essentially um, mitigate some of the potential risk we would have if we found out later the wine was not salvageable. We salvaged everything. There was one lot of wine that came in that was, was quite impacted, um, but we cleaned it up really well, and it was essentially a small component in a huge blend, not of one of our wines, but a wine we sold in bulk. So it was a non-issue in that regard. I don't know where they are today. I've been gone now since through all the like bottling season. So I really haven't stayed abreast with how the wines have evolved now till the end. But um, the team at the, at, at the winery, um, Andy McVeigh, our winemaker at Dobbs, um, he was really positive and just kept his head on straight and just, you know, networked galore, listened to everything. Um, Doug Volstecki is the winemaker on the Wine by Joe side and Brad in our lab, the three of them just got to work, just networked, paid attention, studied, compared, talked. I mean, they did everything they could to just make sure that they had considered everything and we went through it. Um, and up until the point that I left, we felt very optimistic about the quality that was coming out of it. I'm sure, I, I don't know for a fact, but I'm pretty sure they're bottling as planned because mm-hmm. um, the wines were great. So, um, you know, oh, tough, tough stuff, you know, what a year. I mean, what it's, and it's here it is, it's still flaring back up again, you know, we're supposed to be in masks today and, you know, it's, it's still, we're not out of the woods on this, you know, but, um, we've had a little smoke in the valley this year, but not enough that there's going to be any impact so far. I'm in the Southern edge of the Limit Valley now, so a little closer to what's happening in Southern Oregon with fires. So I'm definitely more on edge here. Um, it's it's still uncomfortable we're not out of the woods and you know what this might be the future for from here forward with both covid stuff and fire stuff with what's happening with with the climate so we just need to be prepared i think you know one of the things that i'm grateful for with being part of Honeas vintners is that they're i mean they're in california they're napa valley like they're surrounded by these fires all the time and have been for quite a few years now um they are incredibly proactive when it comes to climate change um they are I mean, I think they could write books and books and books on the subject. They can't believe how they're hyper-focused on water and um, biodynamics and organics and climate change and making sure we are incredibly proactive in looking at the future. And it's been a massive thing for me to learn from them so far. I'm, I'm going to be learning for years from them, especially Rodrigo. Um, but when Rodrigo comes up here, and he'll be here again on Tuesday, um, you know, we walk this property, we're looking at things and we're thinking 10 years down the road and beyond and what's coming and how can we be prepared for um, additional weather like this and, and drought and potential issues that are going to happen here in Oregon, which is a native Oregonian. I, I have to say, like, prior to six months ago, I have never once worried about water in my life. <laughs> like, that's the luxury I've had as an Oregonian. And Rodrigo looks at me and goes, what, Gretchen? Like, what, where have you been? But, you know, like, I actually hated the rain. <laughs> I was sick of the rain, you know? And now I just would wish it would rain. Um, so I'm, I'm going to learn from them a lot. And we're going to together make sure we're prepared to adjust to what's coming in the future. We'll probably see smoke again. COVID's still here. You know, we have to stay nimble and stay smart and be on top of these things so that we can be here for the long term. So speaking of that long term, tell me about the, the sort of the future for yourself as, as you look ahead uh, five, ten years. What, what, are you, what are you looking forward to um, and what are some of the mile, kind of milestones ahead for you? Yeah, well, I'm excited to this, you know, to get Benton Lane back online and bring this, this um, estate back to its full potential. Um, it's a long term process and Huneas 100% gets that. Um, we have a five year plan that we'll be working on at all times and it's, they totally understand this is going to happen overnight. Um, you know me, I like, I want to, I mean, this vintage is, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in the cellar, this whole vintage, by the way, like I've hundred percent moving my RV here. I have a little apartment, but I think I'm going to need my whole RV to, to survive this vintage. So I'll be here through the entire thing, working with the production team. I'm just going to do it because, um, we've been through a lot of transition and I just want to be here for every step of it. So, um, we're going to do as fa- make as much change as we can, as fast as we can, but it's going to take time too. So. Um, I think over the next five years, you know, we'll see this, this, com- this estate come right back online and, and hopefully be in a very different position than it is today. Um, you know, we're going to do some really cool stuff in Oregon with Hineas. Like, I don't know exactly how, what that's going to look like, um, but I just know this company is progressive. 
they are very interested in Oregon and believe in this this category, this state, um, what we're doing here, and and we're gonna we're gonna do some really cool things. So I'm looking forward to seeing what that what that is. Um, you know, and for me personally, like I'm, my kids like, or my life, my husband and my life, like I have this incredible family, and I just look forward to just having finding some balance in it all. You know, I knew that this first year was gonna be really intense, just so much to build and a lot of time put in. Um, it's consuming a lot of my headspace, you know, but I think after I get through that first year, it'll start to slow down and feel more balanced. My husband knows that he's on board. He's totally amazing. Amazing dad. My kids are, oh my gosh, my daughter is almost 17. And my other daughter is almost 15 and my son's 11 and a half. So my kids are at this great age where they're pretty self-sustainable. I've got a driver. I'll have another driver in a year. So like I'm in a stage and I knew that personally where home was going to be good without mama there all the time. You know what I mean? So it's all good, but I look forward to the five years um, in the future just being like a nicer balance of not having to rebuild everything here and getting back more into like a nice good balance of enjoying my family and my life at home and what we're doing here at the estate and whatever else we, you know, we might do in Oregon. It's exciting. It's going to be great. Okay. I'm curious about you. You talked a little bit about your kind of your initial impressions. I'm curious about what you kind of thought of the Oregon wine industry as you start to become aware of it. What you sort of thought about it as a whole, and what are some of the biggest changes you've seen in the industry as a part of it? Mm. You know, I have. It's funny. I went to one of the very first. Um, what, what was it called? The symposium. I don't know what it was called back then, but this was like whew, in the early '90s, probably. It was at Oregon State. Um, it was like in a little tiny room, mm-hmm. and I remember going to that. I was in college and I wasn't even in the industry. I don't know why I ended up there, but I remember thinking like, huh, who are these mom, pa people, right? Um, so tiny. And I think by the time I got into the industry, you know, 99, 2000, like my impression was just positive. I mean, people just, you know, so much like myself, just down to earth and plain and simple, but smart and rooted to the earth. And, you know, just, I don't know. I just, I really, really liked the industry. Um, lots of cool people that I, you know, just met and kind of wanted to be a part of that community. Mm -hmm. Um, and today I would say it's, it's way bigger. Of course, it's still really small though in the whole thing, especially now connected to a California company. I realized like we're just tiny up here still, which I love. It's very Oregonian. Um, so I think it's, it's, you know, while it's grown, it still has a lot of those same, same exact cultural things, you know, very much. I mean, I can call anybody, any friend of mine, and say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? People share advice. We're very transparent, very helpful. I think there's still very strong, it's a very strong you know, element of our cultural stir still. Um, and even like borrowing tools. I mean, we've got some great neighbors. My friend, Andrew Bandy Smith, who's just down the road. Like, he's incredible. He comes by and, you know, talks shop and helps me out. We're going to help each other out this vintage. Um, it happens everywhere in the industry. I mean, at Dobbs, like Jesse Lang would call me and come borrow a pump. Like, you know, it's just like just normal to help each other out. That's still super prevalent today, and I love that. Um, it's certainly more competitive. There's way more players in the industry today, um, especially in Dundee. You know, it was one of those things where we were always working on that elevator pitch and what's unique about us compared to that one and that one and that one. And all the wineries right down the street, let alone up the hill or around the corner, you know. It's, it's more competitive, and I think with more competition, you have to um, try to hold something near to your heart, something special about you that everyone else can't say. Um, but it's, it, that's hard. It's really hard to stand out these days. It is also one of the things that I see as an advantage down here at Benton Lane, believe it or not, because while it's, it's Benton Lane, we're off the beaten path, we're off the beaten path. We're more unique. We're, we potentially could be more special because um, of our unique location and we don't have other competition right around us. So we will be the shining star in this area. So I think that's really kind of a, an advantage. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but back to the industry in general, I would just say that it's, you know, it's grown, but I don't think we've lost any of those cultural um, aspects that I really enjoyed about the industry. In fact, you know, over the years is, I often would find myself at Dobbs, especially just in the office, you know, Excel files on my huge screens and modeling things out. And like sometimes for weeks and weeks and weeks and budgeting hard times, challenging times, challenging tasks, trying to figure it out or HR problems, you name it. And then I'd go to like an industry event symposium or just a meeting or something, or even a consumer event or Pinot in the city in New York city, you name it. 
and come back and be totally revived. And it would be like, at first I was dreading going to that because I was like, I have all this work to do in my office. But it, it, every time revived me and reminded me why I got into this industry, it's the people. It's the people that are just wonderful. And you always connect with, again, whether it's a consumer or a friend in the industry, and you're like, that's what I needed. I needed to get that filled up again and help me remember like why I got into this. It's, it's the people. I love the people. So I don't think we've lost that at all. I think it's great. I think Oregon's culture is super cool. Um, yeah. What about as you look ahead then? Obviously, you're, you're looking ahead from a new, new perspective being here, yeah. but for the industry in general, uh, if, uh, coming out of a pandemic, hopefully eventually at some point, and, yeah. and, and, and looking ahead, what, what does the industry look like? Are there things you're looking forward to in the future? Or are there things you're afraid of in, in the future? Hmm. Boy, I haven't thought about that one too much. Um, I'm not afraid of anything. Like I, you know, I don't mean that in a cocky way. I'm just, I'm not, af- I'm not afraid of anything. We're going to do great. The comp- the industry's going to do great. This company's going to do great. Um, we'll have our challenges for sure. You know, grape supply, oversupply, undersupply, like, you know, climate change, probably the biggest threat coming our way. Um, wholesale is going to be all, forever hard to navigate and probably harder and harder is yet more wine brands are still being born. Um, you know, we're going to see some acquisitions, some mergers and stuff. We're seeing the next generations come in and, or maybe not come in and therefore selling, you know, there's lots of changes that are going to come. Um, but I think it's all normal. Um, well, maybe besides climate change, that's not so normal. I mean, that's, you know, not something we've experienced before. Um, but none of it's scary to me. We just have to go in smartly and be prepared. I think we have to, um, as a leader of a company, and I think other leaders like certainly spend a lot of time thinking about what are those potential threats, what are those potential concerns, and just make sure you're at least thinking on it mm-hmm. and being prepared so there's not a surprise when it does come. I mean, smoke, like, I don't think we thought that was going to happen. Like, I, I didn't think that was going to happen. Like, that caught us. But now we know. Now we know. We don't have all the answers. I don't know if we'll ever have all the answers, but now we won't. It won't be like it was the first time. You know, we're prepared. Um, I don't know. I just think it's exciting times. I think we're going to continue to see Oregon grow. Um, it's a really special place. I think it's exactly what consumers are looking for today. The generation of wine drinkers that we have today are looking for a place that's like Oregon, you know, a place of discovery, a place with so much, you know, wilderness still, and just this really cool culture that we have here in Oregon. Um, Pinot Noir, without a doubt, is, you know, on the marks like it's it's discovered it's happening and i think we're going to continue to see lots of growth and interest in this region um the potential is so high this valley is so big there's still so much untapped dirt there's so, there's so much opportunity still ahead um so i see the future is very bright um yeah i'm just glad to be a part of it and i've got a lot of years left to me to to grow with it so obviously you took a very interesting path into the industry. I, I'm curious if people were to ask you, and I'm sure they have, for words of wisdom or, or advice on, on getting in the industry, especially getting into a leadership role like, like yours, what would you tell people? Well, I tell people all the time this question because I love to mentor people. Like I had some great mentors in my life, in my professional life and personal life, and I think it's incredible. And I'm, it's very near and dear to my heart to help guide people, mentor people, and develop people. Um, and so oftentimes, whenever I run and did, like even a college student, and I've done a lot of this work with Linfield students, um, to pull them aside and say, hey, if you ever want to chat, call me. So they do. Sometimes kids will. They'll call me and they'll come to my office or whatever, meet with me or I'll have a coffee with them. And, um, you know, I am always very straightforward with people. These are the different aspects of the business. You know, think about yourself in which area you think you might be interested. Of course, when anyone's at all thinking about anything production related, first advice is go work a harvest go work a harvest it's just so much will click for you you'll either love it or hate it <laughs> you know because it's it's hard and if and if you love it that's great get started there and even if you want to get into sales and marketing like there's some really huge value to get through working at vintage and we certainly need all those workers to come work vintages for us because it's hard to find people that are wanting to work these days so go work a vintage is often the thing um i just love to be straightforward with people and let them know some of the elements of the business. Um, You know, it's not known for being the most high paying. And you need to know that as a young person. 
or even an older person that's thinking about getting in the industry. I have a lot of friends that'll come my way and say, oh, you work in the wine business, it must be, all these things. I'm like, we don't just sit around and drink wine all day. Like, it's really hard work. And by the way, people have always told me, Gretchen, you could probably make more money if you went and worked somewhere else <laughs> in a different industry. It's not about money. I mean, I'm paid well, don't get me wrong. And a lot of people are paid well, but it's, 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 there's, there's a lot more depth to this industry and it's a lot more like passion and, and um, you're doing something really important. Um, for people and for the land, um, so there's there's a lot of like meaning behind it that's not just showing up in your bank account. Um, but I think people need to know that you know, like you need to love this. You need to find a lot of passion in it. And you know, I know this from being a wife, uh, who's my husband in the beginning, his first career path, like it didn't fill him up, and he wasn't totally happy. And I share that experience with people all the time. Like you need to find what makes you happy. That's what matters. So go experience this industry. These are the various aspects, and if you are interested in this path, start here. You know, if you want to get into sales and marketing, start in a taste room maybe, or go work for a distributor, you know, and grow your way. Um, of course, anything related to production, start at a crush, you know. Just the various, you know, entry points, I guess, is where I kind of tell people, and I give them realistic advice about what growth patterns might be from there, potentially, and compensation, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's a great industry if your heart's into it, and if you find joy in it. Well, the questions that I have for you, is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? I don't know. We covered a lot. I feel, feel almost, it's almost dangerous giving you an open microphone. Yeah, I know. I'm like, like, ooh. Gretchen, what do you want to talk about? I know. I mean, I think we covered it. We covered all the exciting stuff we're doing here at Benton Lane. I'm super excited about that. Um, yeah, it's good. I think we covered all the main stuff. Well, thank you so much for the time, for your stories, for sharing the space with us today. Yeah, thank and you for coming. Go ahead and let you off the hook. All right, thank you.